Before we get started, please remember to like or subscribe to this video or podcast. It really helps others to find Cleaning Up. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Liebreich Foundation and Giladini Foundation. Hello, my name is Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Teresa Ribera. She's the Minister for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge and also a Deputy Prime Minister in the administration of Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez in Spain. Between 2008 and 2011, she was Secretary of State for Biodiversity and Climate Change in the second administration of Prime Minister José Luis Zapatero. Please welcome to Cleaning Up, Minister Teresa Rivera. So, Minister Teresa, welcome to Cleaning Up. Hello, thank you, happy to be here. It's, it's wonderful to see you. Um, I've been trying to remember when we last, I, it, you know, I'm not sure when I last actually saw you and spoke to you in person. It may have been, shamefully, it may have been before the Paris agreements. Wow, is that true? We haven't met uh, since those moments. That's, that's quite incredible. I can't believe this, Michael. <laughs> So we've been on calls. There was the IEA energy efficiency uh, work, and we've certainly been on, on Zoom calls and, and we've had emails and so on. But actually, in terms of sitting, you know, across a, ta- a table or, 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 or interacting, it's been, it's been much too long in any case, that's for sure. So we have to correct this mistake as soon as possible, I hope. Uh, well, let's hope that the pandemic allows us to rectify that. Perhaps COP26 would be a good time at the very latest. Maybe at COP26, we'll be able to, uh, to, to, to do that in-person catch up. Let, let me start. You know, things are moving incredibly fast. What are you actually working on? What is taking time at the moment as we speak? Uh, Well, we are trying to combine different transitions. Of course, the most important and visible one is the energy transition within our system, which is a quite passionate task because I think that this means a a full industrial conversion of the energy system full of um, innovative approaches and uh, and many people and many business uh, innovation ideas coming around and I think that uh, this uh, deserves full attention of regulators and policy policy deciders so to to be sure that things fit reasonably well because we cannot uh, um, face a, a kind of failure in this transformation. I think that people need to experience that things uh, uh, work for the good. Uh, and, and this is quite, quite a challenge, very interesting and very uh, also demanding in terms of uh, renewable energy, how to fix the uh, phase out of coal with no damage for the people, the workers, the communities, uh, how to combine the new challenges in storage or hydrogen, something you also pay attention to, uh, the grids, smart grids, uh, how it works, what are the challenges. So many things, the, the auction system to, to allow people to, to benefit from a lower cost of electricity as soon as possible. So I think, and, and providing the industrial uh, chain some signals on how they can expect and when they can expect they can be uh, demanded by, by by, by the, um, by the uh, um, investors in electricity and, uh, and renewable energy uh, solutions. But at the same time, it's true that uh, we also need to think in, in uh, what we could uh, uh, introduce as uh, the adaptation challenges. So what does this mean for nature? What does this mean for water? What does this mean for soil? What does this mean for the people and the cities? Um, and how we can uh, um, provide good uh, understanding of uh, uh, things that uh, that can work uh, at the local at the local level so many many interesting and thrilling um, initiatives uh, in a very complicated moment but people understanding that things are changing and we are we need to be humble we have experienced that uh, that need through the the pandemics but i i guess that uh, that that's also a, a small side of uh, what it could mean a, a climate crisis so, um your title though is you're not just it's not just energy or transition you've got, you've got the ecological transition and the demographic challenge so two questions in one what is the demographic challenge 
And also, how does that kind of architecture of government work in Spain? Because that's quite a different role than in other countries where it would be energy, maybe climate, maybe, uh, and, and then I'm not sure what, you know, if you explain what the demographic challenge is, that, <laughs> might, that might not yeah. even be recognized in many countries. Now, I think that uh, this is a very interesting question that many people have been asking around because it, it can mean many things. In fact, what we want to stress is that there are imbalances that have been growing up along decades. So the, the wealth, the richness is um, focused and concentrated in some metropolitan areas. And there are wide spaces in, um, in the interior of Spain that uh, um, get depopulated and get uh, older and older along the years without uh, real opportunities uh, of uh, doing things differently from agriculture or other uh, primary sector activities uh, and losing uh, the youth uh, in, in, in many uh, cases with, with no expectations while uh, we can uh, reverse this tendency uh, in, a, in a way that uh, ensures a much more consistent response for nature-based solutions, for uh, innovation and business opportunities if we provide connectivity and the uh, full use of the opportunities provided by the digitalization and so on. So to a certain extent is um, is another type of balance we need to build. So it's not just uh, winning the battle that uh, uh, we have uh, witnessing uh, in terms of uh, the climate battle, the climate fight. It's uh, reconciling with nature, but it is also reconciling with a much more, how to say, equal and balanced uh, approach uh, with this geographical understanding of uh, the opportunities, social and territorial cohesion. Okay, so it's not just generically that the population gets older. It is actually in a, it is actually a, a regional question. I mean, it's about it's about uh, urbanization and it's about the the movement of people away from the rural areas. It's more under this perspective than the other one. But it's true that uh, that was quite impacting when I um, I got this responsibility last year. Uh, I started to receive thousands of letters and messages. So associations of uh, families uh, willing to have additional support for the, uh, having more kids, associations of uh, geriatrics uh, uh, thinking on how to invest and improve uh, the, uh, the care of the elder, associations of, I mean, thousands of uh, rural associations, rural development associations, so understanding that there were opportunities that were being missed and willing to reconcile this aspect. So, yes, full of, full of uh, uh, approaches, but what we tend to strength uh, and to stress is this idea of uh, territorial cohesion and uh, a much more uh, broader understanding of uh, the environmental opportunities uh, in this uh, in this transition. Well, so you're very lucky you didn't also receive a letter from me at that point because I have an initiative uh, that, that your remarks have spurred me to think about the connection um, called Moving Mountains that I've been working for the last 10 years on the um, uh, sustainability in mountain communities, which of course in Spain, you've got many, you know, you've got the, uh, the, the communities in the north and the north, uh, well, I suppose, right, right across the, the, the mountain Everywhere. range. Everywhere, I love, I, you don't know what you are going to propose, but I like the idea. Well, mountains I, I, and living in mountains is part of my, um, my task. Very good. Well, we will definitely hook up on that because um, the Moving Mountains was about sustainability of mountain community. We framed it as mountain communities, not just because it's not just environmental sustainability. It also has to be social and economic sustainability. And I'm pretty sure that uh, your mountain communities have got the same problems as uh, right across the Alps, the Andes, the Rockies, the, Himal the Himalayas, the, all of them. The young people go away. The environment is very fragile. Uh, the, the, the tax base disappears, the agriculture becomes uh, uneconomic compared to industrial agriculture. These are all the same issues, right? That's the spirit. So we yeah. share this task too. Okay, so we will come back to you one. and, and uh, we'll create a Spanish chapter maybe of moving mountains. That'd be a, a good thing to do. Um, but you have also, um, the, the second part of my question in terms of the structure with respect to the energy sector, the transport sector, I mean, do all these ministers report to you or are you having to sort of ask them for favors to get the transition done? 
No, I think that the the, um, the coordination work uh, is is going very well. I think that um, the message of um, some uh, vice prime ministers uh, working on uh, um, ensuring uh, how how uh, everything needs to be consistent uh, explains why there is a vice prime minister working on the social aspects, a vice prime minister working on the economic aspects, and a vice prime minister working on the environmental aspects, which is me. And, right, right. and then <clears throat> uh, all the ministries working in, in, in a team trying to ensure that things go smoothly well. And, and, and it works this way. I mean, of course, we may have some uh, internal disputes on how fast uh, how far uh, we go in mobility or urban planning or, or agriculture or whatever, but uh, with the same type of spirit and targets, and, and it goes reasonably, reasonably well. Right. So, you, because your your official title is that you are uh, you you are in charge. It's a long of this, title. <laughs> it's a long title. The the ecological transition and the demographics, but you are also uh, the the fourth, I believe, the fourth. Deputy uh, Prime it. Minister, and I'm not That's sure what, uh, you know, I, I, this conjures images of the third and the second and the first, and I don't know how many, but but it's, a, but that is an important coordinating role, is what you're saying, and it's not just an honorific title, it actually means that you coordinate across the, your issues into the other ministries, is that correct? That's it. So trying to ensure that when we talk about innovation policies or science and research or agriculture or uh, um, the Arctic and the oceans uh, and fisheries or mining, mining is also my, my portfolio. So that's on the energy side. But I mean, everything uh, is reasonably consistent. So to ensure that uh, there are no strange things happening around. And of course, as in any other big team, uh, there may be small things that uh, do not perfectly fit. But in general terms, it goes very, very smoothly and it goes very well. And I think it is quite an, a, um, an inspiring exercise because when we talk about uh, labor opportunities, reskilling people, we need to think on the type of society and the type of economy and the type of challenges that the business communities will be having. So we need to think in ecological terms too. And uh, when we think about uh, innovation, what is uh, what is happening in the world in terms of uh, research and innovation in the technology uh, solutions, research and innovation in, in basic observation and basic science, and, and it relies back it relates back to to, uh, to some ecological challenges. So yes, things things. Um, well, I think I, it's it's uh, it's the type of work we all experience in our normal social relations. We we work in in, in networks, and and we understand that uh, uh, things are. Uh, um, things fit in a type of ecosystem. It's not just you and your own in an isolated manner taking decisions that solve whatever you've got in front of you. Is that you need to understand and to, to combine with, uh, with the approach uh, and the focus coming from others to, to have a much more uh, real uh, understanding of uh, what, uh, what is important and how we can make the difference. I, I'm absolutely fascinated because, I mean, what we're what we're talking about is complexity and systems. This is systems thinking, and so you know, government has had its siloed departments, which kind of worked, you know, well in certain circumstances, but it tends to fail on these big. Um, cross-departmental or systemic challenges. And then we have different countries trying to approach that in different ways. Um, so you see Jacinda Ardern in uh, New Zealand trying to, um, you know, sort of uh, tr trying to come at it w one way with looking at the, the um, changing the metric away from just GDP to look at these kind of larger metrics. Um, in the UK, my sense is we've sort of tried to change. We've moved a bunch of ministerial chips around. So we had we had deck, then we had bays. Now apparently we don't have an industrial strategy, um, and it doesn't. But we are. There's also a big move here in the UK to try to integrate systems thinking. However, it's done uh, because. I suspect it won't be just done by renaming some ministries or maybe moving one piece from one ministry to another ministry. We've got to get that cross-ministry uh, coordination improved, haven't we? I think that um, we have been educated in, in, uh, in a way that we tend to think in a silo uh, way. And uh, we are learning that this doesn't work. The reality is much more complex. So um, uh, it's... Uh, it demands a, a 
personal commitment uh, to ensure that uh, this systemic thinking uh, happens at all the different levels of the administration and that the relation with your colleagues go smoothly so to understand why they may have some concerns on this point, on this other point. But for instance, talking about mobility, mobility's infrastructure, its industrial chain, its um, energy system, its um, innovation, so how, how its cultural change, so how this means, or its public service, so mass, mass transportation, how, how this fits together. You need at least four or five ministries working together. And we, we it's a challenge, but we need to succeed. And, and it happens a little bit everywhere. What about green finance? Of course, we need the uh, finance industry moving to a shift on what it is value and what it is uh, risk, uh, and a, a, a different understanding on how they can uh, retrofit traditional instruments or create new instruments. And this is people working on finance, people understanding the green challenges. So I think that, uh, that well, it is, um, it is also quite inspiring because uh, it, it's not boring at all. You need to, <laughs> you need to, to combine uh, different knowledges and different features and characters and, and, and being very humble to, to pay attention to all the good ideas that, uh, and all the good things that are happening around, but also being aware of uh, the risk you don't want to, to, to be confronted to. Yeah, no, it's definitely it's definitely a, a different era because we, we we there's just almost everything is connected to everything within this net zero um, uh, and the ecological transformation that you talk about. Um, there are there is almost no government department where you could say, right, now you just go off and do your thing. Here's your metric. Goodbye. It just doesn't exist at all. In many in many ways, it, it probably is reminiscent of a, of a wartime challenge where mm -hmm. every single piece of the system actually is going to experience change. If it's not leading change, it's going to experience a change. And there are terrible trade-offs, aren't there? Because we've seen, you know, in France, we saw the yellow vests. In the UK, uh, we didn't go as far as the yellow vests, but we have got trade-offs in terms of the leveling up agenda, where, you know, trying, to, like, like yourself, trying to ensure that no regions are left behind in this transformation. Um, and some of those trade-offs are very difficult. You've dealt with a few very early in your time back in government, correct? Yes. Well, something I I uh, I brought as a, as a kind of previous experience is that the human factor is not so rational. So we need to pay attention to emotions uh, and uh, and feelings. Uh, and uh, uh, this means that the social dimension is always very important if we want to go into a very deep transformation in a very short time. Uh, um, and, and of course, the phase out of coal is quite a good example of that, or the yellow vest is, is connected to that. You say, yes, it is very rational to, to facilitate, I don't know what type of uh, taxation in order to whatever, but who is going to get the impact and how uh, um, strong is that person or that community to be able to, to, to digest that impact. And if you don't think about this, uh, this potential spillover effects, you may face in a situation uh, that uh, is not manageable anymore. So I think that these type of things are very important. And sometimes uh, um, you don't realize uh, till the moment it is very late, but uh, as it is very important to try to anticipate as much as possible and to think what are the type of um, uh, social responses that can facilitate uh, and, and smooth this uh, this transformation, this change. In the in the phase out of coal, I think that there were a couple of things that were very very important. Um, the first of them being, we need to pay a kind of a tribute to to um, to to towns, communities that for decades have been providing welfare to our economies and to our societies. So it, is, it was the grandparents, the parents, the, the, the sons uh, working in mining um, and, and they were very proud and they, they are the origin of the union, so solidarity among workers. So there were many things that were very important for them and it, you cannot just say, hey, sorry, this is not your time anymore, bye bye. No, I think that it is important to, to pay a tribute to, to, this, uh, to these memories and at the same time to invest in the creation of opportunities in those areas. So to avoid that people feel so, so I cannot have any type of expectation to make my living in my 
a small village and I need to move away. That, that is terrible for a family. So how we can invest, how we can facilitate this transformation. And as I said, this is not just macroeconomics. This is not just because the market is going to solve. This is not just because the technology is easier or cheaper or whatever. It is the social dimension, the human factor that we need to pay attention to since the, the very first moment we, we try to, to explore how to move things forward. This happens in the case of Spain. This is also something to pay attention to when talking about water, for instance. Um, water is a scarce, a scarce um, good with very important environmental implications, but also very important uh, development and comfort implications. So the, um, the state, the good state, the healthy state of water is important in terms of uh, how much and how good, but also the allocation of uh, whatever it exists on how we can provide additional resources is very important. And the, the decision making around water is, is, also, is also key and needs to pay attention to the history behind uh, the current understanding of uh, the access to water for uh, the different communities interested in water. Uh, absolutely, and you get quite a bit of resistance actually from some of the people working on climate find it outrageous that you made a payment to the mining sector, to the, the you know, the, they see that as, uh, as, in a sense, rewards for bad behavior. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, they are their own worst enemies and, you know, sort of fighting any sort of engagement with oil and gas companies, with coal companies, with the communities that are dependent on those industries and so on. Uh, and I'm very much with you that I think one has to one has to engage and have to understand that they are, um, you know, that, that, that they have their they have legitimate uh, claims for for funding and for social inclusion. I think that um, it, it, to me it is important to assess who deserves uh, solidarity and and who is in a position to manage on his or her own. So please go on your own. And, uh, and, um, and there are big changes and, and big differences between, between these, uh, these situations. Uh, I think that a big corporate uh, uh, has much more instruments to make uh, his her own transition uh, a long time than a, a small community of workers, for instance, first thing. Second thing, uh, I, I guess that uh, the debate is not so much uh, what from one day to the next one, but how much time we've got to prepare ourselves. So it's not a question of punishment, but a question of facilitating the transformation. And of course, the public resources are not uh, with no limits. We, we need to pay attention where the public resources uh, um, are more interestingly being invested. It's not just to pay whatever. Uh, for instance, something that strikes me is um, a, uh, this, this debate in Germany or uh, some other debates we have been witnessing these this last weeks about the energy chapter and so on uh, with, uh, with um, investments and expectations on coal and gas in some European countries, continental European countries, and companies claiming for compensations uh, because of this. I think that uh, um, uh, th th that, that was quite a shock in my case when I first was asked, are you going to compensate your utilities because of the phase out of coal? And I said, of course not. Uh, coal is out of market and it is the market, who, with the one which is pushing them away. Uh, and at the same time, we could be um, facing a, a different kind of fight. Uh, people asking for compensations for the cost of emitting uh, in uh, greenhouse gases in the past. So let, let's avoid that discussion. Let's focus into the future. Let's see how we can provide new opportunities for people and how corporates can evolve towards something that makes sense. Because of course, we need utilities uh, working in a different kind of energy model and, and, and it is good business for them. So uh, let, let's avoid the confrontational aspects and let's identify where the common ground is so to facilitate being together in this transformation. But I think that uh, that's also a social emotional aspect in a, different, <laughs> in a different focus, but I think that that's also something we need to pay attention to. How, um, how sound is the, um, the willingness to be a partner, a, stake, a key stakeholder in the transformation uh, when talking to, to different uh, corporates, so to different shareholders behind the corporates.
Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm going to jump in because, uh, you know, the taxonomy is not about learning. It's about, it's mm -hmm. about creating a list of sustainable Fixing. activities. And in a sense, mm. I would argue, I will argue that it's anti-innovation, right? Because it says this is good, this is bad. It tries to di uh, divert money to the good, which happens to be, you know, good according to some committee today. Um, it excludes, frankly, some of the most promising technologies around nuclear completely not in and then it doesn't seem to be although there's still a discussion but I can't see a route to them really being embraced and included it's anti-innovation it's not about learning it's about it, it, it's about box ticking isn't it so what you could suggest because I think that there are two options one of them is to understand that this is a flexible ongoing approach which probably helps to better understand and learning as I said but also to orientate the color, the cost of capital and the alternative is doing nothing. Oh, is the alternative doing nothing? No, I don't think the alternative is doing nothing. What could you do? Reporting and that's all. Well, so I, I can see the value of a taxonomy at the individual project level. Okay, let me be clear. I don't want to just, I don't, you know, we could have a lovely, you know, um, <laughs> pun, punch and Judy uh, type discussion, you know, all bad, all good. Um, I think when you look at, let's say, green bonds, the way they're used sometimes to do the most, you know, the most stupid things from an environmental perspective. So I see the value of a taxonomy there. But when you start to look at it at a corporate level and, and adding it up and trying to judge companies, and then you're trying to add up companies into portfolios and you try to judge investors and you have these huge data gaps and it requires... Um, disclosure of revenues, uh, disclosure of costs, disclosure of investment. I mean, a level of disclosure that no financial accounting system requires um, that in and of itself could be a huge com uh, competitive disadvantage for Europe. Um, I, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it, you know, what I think, if you say, if you ask me, what is the alternative? What I really like is the idea of putting climate risk into financial accounts. Right? If, if values of companies are being impaired by climate damages, that should be in the accounts. And the investors, when they see those write-offs, they will react instantly, as opposed to this great box-ticking exercise. So I take note of your, of your recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think it is important to reflect somehow this, this climate risk when taking your decisions. And then the, the, the big discussion is, how far, how best we can do that exercise. So to, to ensure that uh, that everybody gets uh, consciousness of, uh, of this uh, climate risk. Is there a positive list to facilitate um, the, uh, the direction of the flows towards something? Is it too risky as you are saying? So I think that, yes, there are two second row question marks that, um, that are open and are legitimate in terms of uh, the public discussion. So. This is the, 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 how to say, the, uh, the fascinating uh, years where we are going at the highest speed in this transformation. So it's normal that we have these discussions. But, but it also comes down to this the question about systems, that we are dealing with a very complex system. I'll give you an example. Um, let's say in order to get huge penetration of renewables, we need to have some unabated gas peakers but they only run, let's call it five days a year, maybe when it's very cold or something, right? <laughs> They're filthy, but they only run five days a year, but they might enable the rest of the 360 days a year of green energy, green, green electricity. I would be okay with that. But of course, in the taxonomy, they would be called filthy and they would be outside and they would be ostracized and any investor who touched them ultimately will be you know, will, will be uh, discriminated against maybe even by the central banks. Now, to me, that feels like a very blunt instrument. Well, I think that uh, that's the taxonomy aspect, but com dealing with uh, the issue you have raised, there are other question marks that are still open. So uh, what, is, what is the price to be paid by this um, availability? Uh, or we build capacity markets to ensure that uh, things are is reasonably well. So we have seen this in Texas, $9,000, um, I mean, crazy, crazy thing, something that, well, in the United Kingdom was terrible too. In, in January, the price of uh, gas was crazy. 
uh, in Spain it was crazy, but not as crazy as, as, yeah. in, as in the United Kingdom or Japan. So I think that this type of discussions, not only how to orientate the investments, but also how to make things work in a context where there are many other things that we are buying. Uh, yeah, it's not just availability, access to electricity, but uh, also this, uh, this well-functioning uh, system that uh, deserves different signals and how we combine them is also quite challenging in, in, in terms of uh, the regulation that we need to put in place. So, Teresa, I'm going to paraphrase. I think what you're saying is it's okay if that those gas peakers are discriminated against in terms of cost of capital via the taxonomy because we're going to subsidize them at the same time through a capacity market. No, but you are, you are, you are making a joke out of my comment, which I'm not <laughs> going to accept. But I think that uh, we need to live with gas for a while, that's for sure. Uh, uh, the question is uh, not only in the case of gas, but what is, what is the need uh, to ensure that the system is going to work till the moment uh, we count on a, a different kind of backup. So the importance of storage. So can we create markets of storage capacity? Can we create market of a, um, a, uh, availability capacity? Uh, so I think that there are things that are coming up in the discussion, which are pretty interesting, and we will have to, 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 to intervene and to regulate that context too, because otherwise uh, things may become crazy also in terms of price. And that goes in parallel with your discussion, uh, how far uh, the, um, the guidelines, the orientation in terms of uh, what is positive, what is negative in terms of taxonomy uh, can impact uh, for the good or for the bad uh, in terms of uh, innovation and, 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 and the interest of the, the protection of the interests of consumers. No, I think that that's, that's, that's the, the, uh, the difficulties of um, our discussions. I agree, and I think that um, whilst it would be uh, it would be um, ideal if policy could be so joined up that there are never any perverse incentives or never any cross cutting issues, that's, <laughs> that's not realistic. Bad. I mean, there are going to be times, and and you're going to get you're going to get teased or criticised by other people, you know, other than me for things that work against each other. Um, but you have always been a market person, and I well, if. Very market person, and I've always been a very public, a, um, public uh, policy person. Public so policy, that yeah. that's normal. We need to talk. I, 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 absolutely, and I think that that is again. These are fascinating discussions because I think that um, you know what you're seeing uh, also on the political right is it's having to now do some um, intellectual catch up because. Just saying, oh, well, free trade is good in all circumstances, or you know, deregulation is good in all circumstances. It's just not good enough. We have planetary boundaries, uh, and so there's work to be done. I want to finish, if I might, though. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, I have done these cleaning up conversations with uh, Rachel Kite, Laurence Tubiana, uh, Christiana Figueres, uh, Claire O'Neill. Um, actually, so I haven't done Laurence Tubiana yet because I'm going to in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but um, these are all people, these are all women who are deeply involved in the Paris uh, climate negotiations and the Paris agreements. And you at the time, you were out of government, but you were, uh, you were very closely involved via this organization called IDRI. Can you say a couple of words about what you were doing? We were facilitating a, um, possible solutions to the bottlenecks that we thought uh, we could find uh, in the formal negotiations in Paris. So uh, since uh, 2013 14, we started to work uh, on different issues. So, how to, how to um, facilitate a better thinking in the long term how to ensure that um, all the countries, including those who are more reluctant uh, to transparency, could feel comfortable in a reporting mechanism that could ensure that things work and could deliver confidence among the different partners, um, and um, to identify which were going to be the tricky issues, including issues such as uh, adaptation 
global adaptation goal or cooperation in order to facilitate a much more consistent economic uh, and financial flows towards uh, climate action and climate resilience. So uh, the, the role was to facilitate intellectual discussion and to provide some inputs in order to, to get some uh, almost ready solutions for and, the and, negotiations. And you were feeding those in to Laurence Tubiana, who was the negotiator, and presumably to Laurent Fabius. Uh, the, the, of, not course, only. Uh, and of course, it, uh, we work very closely to the, to the French government, but not only. I mean, uh, along the months, uh, we were convening different informal meetings with uh, negotiators coming from all over the world on the different aspects. So and, to understand and, where the difficulties may be and where the solutions may be. And, and of course, I, I, in my list of the women that I've had on this uh, on cleaning up, I omitted Amber Rudd, who was the UK negotiator, actually mentioned Claire uh, O'Neill, who became energy minister only afterwards. Um, did it make a difference that so many of the leaders of that process were women and contrast that to 2015, uh, sorry, to, uh, 2009? <laughs> COP15, 2009, <laughs> uh, which was the kind of the, the guy COP, which failed, and then there was the women's COP, which <laughs> succeeded. Is that a fair characterization? You know that this is something that uh, has been a long story in the climate process uh, at the beginning because there were no women in the, in the different governing boards of the UNFCCC, which was quite striking. But then in the negotiators, among the negotiators, the leading negotiators tended to be more men than women. And, um, and um, what we started to, um, to realize is that there were more capacity, flexibility and pragmatism in some of the women negotiators than among our colleagues in, uh, in the men's side. So we started to make some jokes, but also to get some, some, some informal approaches to understand how things were going on. And, and, and um, there's a small story on this, because in 2009, you know, uh, someone who became very famous and now uh, play in a different role with some difficulties in Europe, who was the Venezuelan negotiator, Claudia Salerno, who stopped. Uh, the plenary and uh, yeah, well that was the, the the face the visible face of uh, of the um, of the implosion of the negotiations said hey guys uh, I'm not here uh, to stay uh, forever I have kids at home waiting to enjoy Christmas so let's be pragmatic and solve the problems and I think that this is an approach which is very common in in many of the women negotiators so yes all the ladies that you have seen quoted, that you have listed, are very fantastic ladies, quite committed, but also quite pragmatic in terms of understanding what are the problems of the other people in the room and how and where we can identify the common ground to reach an agreement and keep on going and be constructive in the solutions. Very good, yes. I mean, it's certainly an unusual negotiation because there's so much sort of uh, Parito optimization. There's so the, the difference between the walk away and, and being successful is so uh, enormous that definitely it requires exploring. Uh, well, and also not it's not just a technology or a trade discussion. It is also social. So uh, um, we'll have to. Because see. I think that what we need is to raise the the bar everywhere, uh, and that doesn't happen in 15 days slot uh, among diplomatic negotiators. You need to raise the bar everywhere. And to raise the bar everywhere, you need to get a better understanding of the public opinion on what is at stake. So we need to, to, to build and feed uh, elsewhere. And then the diplomatic gatherings are just to fix and ensure that we are learning, we are moving at the right speed, what else we can do. But I think that it is the, the real work needs to take place elsewhere, mm. in all our capitals, in our offices, in, in our landscapes. I mean, I think that, uh, that the different communities need to think and shift the type of thinking to, to, mm. to succeed on the climate action. And that's uh, why there are so many different communities around the cops, the financial, the industrial, the, the, the rural areas. I mean, plenty of people trying to, to learn and to share uh, their understanding on how to, to do better. I must say, I do worry that when the historians write the history in the, in the distant future, when they write the history of this period, they will say, the guys nearly trashed the planet, but then the women took over 
and fixed it. <laughs> and that'll be it. That will be the entire history of this sort of 50 year period. Well, let's try to combine in a much more inclusive way. So men and women working together. Eh? <laughs> Okay, so maybe there's still hope for us. Um, Teresa, thank you. And in fact, we have this additional, this additional endeavor on moving mountains. So uh, we have many things to do, Michael. We have a number of things we need to follow up from this discussion. Uh, the moving mountains, uh, also anything that you want to talk about on, on finance and a number of areas. Resilience, we didn't really get onto, except your comments on Texas, which were well taken. Uh, we have much to do, much work to do. And maybe I'll see you uh, during the COP meetings in Glasgow later this year. But thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you as always. And uh, I wish you the best for the rest of your day. Thank you. A pleasure for me too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> So that was Teresa Ribera, Minister for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge, also a Deputy Prime Minister in the Spanish government. And that brings to an end this season of Cleaning Up. We'll be back after Easter with a new season, that's season three, and we'll be kicking it off with a very special guest, but I'm not going to tell you right now who it is. See you after Easter. <laughs>